Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It's Thursday, August 18th, 2011, and our special guest tonight is Jeff Piontek. Jeff, welcome. Uh, thanks for having me, Steve. Really delighted to have you here. Uh, this is a summer conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. The Future of Education is sponsored by Learn Central. Uh, it's the social network for educators uh, created by Illuminate Now Blackboard Collaborate. It's also sponsored by my Web 2.0 Labs project at web20labs.com. Coming up November 2nd and 3rd, our worldwide free virtual conference on the future of libraries. This is going to be a blast. We've had about 2,000 people sign up since we announced this conference, uh, just picking up an enormous amount of steam, library2011.net or .com. Also coming up in November, the Global Education Conference. I know many of you are waiting with bated breath for the call for proposals. It should be tomorrow or Monday. Anyway, lots of fun, five days, all free, worldwide. Uh, this was a blast last year. We expect it to be as much fun this year. Coming up on the future of education, uh, next week on Thursday, Bob Compton on his film, The Finland Phenomenon. You may remember him from uh, Two Million Minutes. Uh, he's going to talk about his new film that was um, narrated by Tony Wagner from Harvard. Uh, on the 30th, the Dufours will talk about learning communities. On the 13th of September, Howard Gardner on The Unschooled Mind. Sam Chaltain comes back to talk about his new book, Bob Gleiner, on his movie, Lessons from the Real World. Sylvia de Oliveira on MIT's Open Courseware, Bruce Umstead on iPads in the Classroom, Peter Cookson on Children's Education Bill of Rights. Lots of fun coming up and much more getting scheduled. If you've missed a show, they are all recorded. They're in full Illuminate recordings and also in MP3s. But Gary Lopez, MP3 is not up yet because of a technical issue on my side. But Gary talked to us about hippocampus.org, the free open resource. Uh, Doug Rushkoff talked about uh, Program or Be Programmed. Jim Mayfield on humanitarian work in village community education. Lots of fun, fun sessions up there. Please feel free to to listen to them. They are all free. Uh, download the MP3 or watch the full Illuminate recording. So this is where we're going to give you a chance to let us know where you're participating from. So look for the tools to the left of the whiteboard, left of the map, and you're looking for the star. If you click on that and then click on the map, you should be able to indicate where you're listening from. You can also uh, shout out in the chat, Maybe the time and the temperature. Looks like we have someone from the British Isles, Australia, North America, and of course Jeff from Hawaii, maybe somebody else. Always fun to see the variety. Look, some have been creative and have swapped out for the smiley face or the pointer. You get that by clicking on the little arrow in the bottom right of that that star icon and gives you a choice of other uh, images to use. Well, we're sure glad to have you here, wherever you're listening from. And if you're listening to the recording, thanks so much for taking the time to do so. So Jeff, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to spend a little bit of time with you. The format tonight is very much a conversation, and uh, we're really going to focus on uh, change in education and uh, even ideas about reform. Um, many of us got to know you from the ISTE keynote. Unfortunately, I didn't see that keynote. I was uh, doing something in the open source lab at ISTE at the time, and it's not available online. So why don't you give us sort of a two-minute overview of your background and maybe kind of how that led to speaking at ISTE. Uh, thanks, Steve. Um, my background, I started out as a science teacher in the South Bronx, uh, worked there for a, a bunch of years, uh, and worked my way up the food chain, per se, in uh, education there to become a staff developer and worked as a staff developer for a school and then uh, staff developer for a district um, and was fortunate enough to actually uh, end up as the director of technology for that same small district in, in uh, New York City, um, which New York City Department of Education was one of the sub-districts in the, in the Department of Education. Uh, as time went on, it was uh, 
it's amazing just the, the opportunities that presented themselves. Uh, I ended up becoming a regional director where I oversaw 120 schools. And um, prior to my leaving uh, New York City, which was in 2004, five school year, I uh, was the director of te instructional technology. Um, moved to Hawaii. Uh, and people, you know, just are amazed. I'm here, so am I. And I open my mouth, and I, I tell people I'm from Hawaii. I hear my Brooklyn accent, and most of them laugh. But uh, I was the director of science education for the state of Hawaii for uh, three years, and uh, got to the point where I realized that there was something lacking in the education system here. Um, and from, from inside the system, uh, it wasn't going to change what we were doing. We were able to build robotics programs and become the first state to adopt a full online professional development through National Science Teachers Association for science teachers. But uh, we went from 12 robotics teams to 300 teams in, in literally three and a half years, all funded by business and, and industry. And what I did was I actually looked at the uh, aspect of how do we change these things to build a different economy, and I went back and I opened up a public charter school. That school is now in our fourth year a fourth year of existence. We went from 250 students to 1,200 students uh, this year. We've had over 1,000 applicants for the 200 students we had this year, and we've performed uh, in, in reading and math uh, very good on our standard assessments. Over 80% of our students passed their reading assessment. And just on ISTE, I don't know how people uh, understand the voting was done by, they opened it up to people to vote. Uh, I was actually nominated by my father. And my parents are my biggest advocates and my biggest fans, and, and I kid around about it, but they put it open to the masses of people, and I was fortunate enough to beat out Chris Lehman, who's a, ne a very talented principal and a, another educator I have a lot of respect for. And uh, I was actually uh, the keynote at that conference, which opened my realm up uh, to a global market in the sense of people I've met, people I've collaborated with, people I've been able to work with now since then. So I'm intrigued with the New York connection, and I want to ask you a question. We had John Taylor Gatto on the show, and he was New York City Teacher of the Year three years in a row, and New York State Teacher of the Year two years in a row. And I often bring him up in um, when I'm giving talks about education because he quit education in 1990 um, very publicly, saying he felt that he was actually making students dumber. As a, as a public educator, did you have any awareness of him? Does that name even ring a bell for you now? Well, I know who he is only because of st I still do work in New York City for professional development for teachers, and I do grant writing. So I actually know who he is through the, the channels and people I work with currently in New York. Um, I have a lot of respect for him. He's actually done phenomenal things. But if you think about the aspects of what, you know, starting education years ago when some of us, as you can see, my hair is gray, uh, you were given a set of keys, and you were given a classroom. And you basically went in there and you know, did what you did with your training that you were given in your education setting. I was a biology major with a minor in math. Uh, I wasn't an education major, so I got my master's in education, and then I actually went on to do my PhD work. Uh, but you look at what education was like back then, I, and I understand what he's talking about. I definitely can relate to you know, the understanding of what people expect from you and how you're expected to do things. So you, you're, sort of your answer to this then is forming a charter school, and chartered schools get um, sort of a, a varied reaction from people. Um, some like to quote that the statistics show that chartered schools do worse than public schools. Others like to talk about the sort of the engagement level of those who start them. Um, is your experience, do you think, representative of the larger value of chartered schools? You know, most of the places across the country where there are charter schools, um, they perform similar to the demographic in the Department of Education schools or the district schools that are normally there. My answer, per se, is not really to start the charter school. Is that I felt stifled in the sense that I knew I could do so much more. Um, given the opportunities I had here, I, I had a great working relationship with the administration at the time with the governor of Hawaii, Linda Lingle, and I had a great uh, uh, working relationship with the current governor and their administration as well because they understand what I'm trying to do in the sense of Hawaii is a, a two economy state per se in the sense of when you get out of school you either go into construction for land development and land use or you go into the travel and tourism industry. There is no other industry for children to go into here so I, when I was a director of science of the state I was trying to actually diversify the economy and bring the high-tech field or the science field.
field here. And that's what our school primarily focuses on. It's a blended model uh, hybrid school. And we focus on actually giving kids the core basics, but also uh, proficiency in things like 2D animation, 3D animation, digital game design, and stuff like that. So I think that my personal answer is it gave me a lot of freedom and flexibility to build the programs I wanted to outside of the infrastructure that currently existed in the Department of Education there. So what do you think the role of the local educational culture is? And is there a degree to which chartered schools are able to kind of um, leverage their novelty and their startup phase to build a local culture around education? Is that part of the value? Well, I think that all public schools are central to the community. I mean, if you look at you know any school that's been opened anywhere in the, in the country or the world, for that matter, it re normally reflects the population that they serve in that specific area. You know, so I think that one of the challenges that we always have then is when you're opening up a school, whether it be a Department of Education school or a charter school, and a lot of Department of Education actually are sponsors of charter schools and actually are um, opening up their mini labs per se, because charter schools are supposed to be research and development for the larger uh, districts at hand, you know. Um, and I think that one of the things we have to remember is that no matter what, the schools are challenged when they open. Uh, you're always going to run into different, uh, different challenges in the sense that you're actually doing things outside the box. So I think that we have to think out the well thought out, implementing a phased planning um, of, a, of the system to make sure that it actually works when you open up a school and, you know, dreaming big as to what the opportunities and what the successes can be. I mean, you should always dream big. So one of the themes that we've explored in the interview series has been the role of teachers and the degree to which they often aren't participating in a 21st century work environment but are asked to teach 21st century skills. How have you bridged that gap? Well, I think the biggest thing now is starting the school up from scratch and with five teachers and hiring, you know, the, the, the best we possibly could at the time. Um, out of those five teachers, only two remain at the school, but we actually have 40 teachers right now working here. Uh, the best thing is the ability to hire based upon what their skill set is. But we've also gone to university and worked closely with the uh, University of Hawaii and uh, I've spoken at other universities talking about how we need to reform the teacher education programs to build in the 21st century core competencies so that teachers can actually better serve their students. When I spoke at TEDx in, in Vancouver, I actually spoke about our next generation of teachers coming out and I mean more technologically proficient than our current ones, obviously. And as time goes on, they get going to get more and more proficient because the technophiles and you know the Gen Y and the Gen Xs are actually in the workforce then. That's when you'll see a technological shift in education, but the problem is the paradigm will not change until the people that make the decisions are the technophiles as opposed to the technophobes and people that embrace technology. So I think it's just a training thing when teachers are coming out um, to making sure that they have the skill set. So a number of people who sign up for my Classroom 2.0 network will put that they're signing up because they're in a teaching program or a, a graduate program. Uh, do you think that the technological proficiency of this generation actually translates into understanding how to bring those technologies into the classroom, or do you have to spend um, you know, a fair amount of time working specifically on that? Um, you know what, I think that just because you have the skills and you're able to use Facebook or MySpace, that's MySpace doesn't mean that you can actually teach a student how to actually proficiently create a blog or a wiki or how to actually, you know, create a mashup or something else. Uh, I think that one of the best relationships that we ever had was a grant that I had when I was in uh, overseeing the uh, districts in the Bronx. I had about 120 schools involved in this grant. And uh, it was to actually integrate the teacher education, people that were in the graduate teacher education program, working hand in hand with the teachers in the school. So one day a week they had a grad student who was actually going to school for to ed tech or for uh, tech, educational technology or some, something else in that, de that defined area and working with the teachers hand in hand in the classroom. And we saw a phenomenal change and it's still the districts that I worked with are still number one and number two in New York City in technology use in their schools. So I think it's actually just working, understanding the pedagogical implications of integrating technology, but also of actually utilizing those tools to the, to the best which our kids actually at a, you know, 20-somethings can do right now or younger. 
It feels like there's a big shift taking place from a conception of professional development as something that gets pushed down to personal learning networks where educators themselves are individually choosing their professional development. Some of that, I think, is economic. But how do you feel about the personal learning network movement? Well, j just to start, I have a huge issue with the term professional development because I think that there's different frameworks for professional development in the sense of that if you look at just coming to a lecture, when I speak as a keynote or someone else actually speaks as a keynote or you go to a professional development for two hours with someone, that's not really professional development. The professional development is taking the context that you would actually have something to develop. That's professional exposure. You're being exposed to new ideas, something that's new in the, uh, the concepts that you're trying to implement at your school. So you're actually taking in professional exposure, and then what you do is you look at it and you say professional improvement should be the next stage. Because professional improvement is actually then taking the person you are as a professional and then going to the next stage where you're improving yourself and then developing that skill once you have it. So that, that, that's the, it's just the issue of professional development, and actually I think that's something that people always, um, as, on a larger scale, overuse the term as a sense of what they, they're looking to do. As far as professional learning communities or you know, learning networks, uh, I think that they're great if you actually have a defined idea of what you're trying to accomplish. I've seen people go in and take classes or become you know, part of small learning communities, and it doesn't really fit what they're trying to accomplish as a professional, and they end up dropping out or not, take, you know, uh, not taking the time and investing the time in it. The biggest thing that I've seen is that you have to understand, and I talk about this in my keynote, is you have to follow what your passion is about. If you're passionate about technology and education or science and education, whatever it is, find out how that, that PLN is going to fit into your world and make you a better professional to help your kids uh, as well. So there's so much I want to talk about, but you've just given me kind of a springboard to a, a next kind of fun area. So we talk about following passions, and that's uh, something we've been hearing a lot about lately. And we think of that in the context of students and discovering their individual passions and individual um, interests and talents. How realistic is that movement? And are there are we losing something if we're not thinking about just creating structured context of knowledge that would allow them later to do that? Where do you fall in that kind of spectrum with regard to sort of rigorous uh, standardized content and kind of personalized uh, passion-based interest learning? Well, I think for us here at the school, and I think that on a larger scale, when you're offering online classes, you have a lot more variety to be able to present the, um, the content uh, for those students in a rigorous environment. Um, at the school, we use K-12 curriculum, and we're f it's phenomenal for us. It works for us. It's great. It's rigorous. Um, it's standards-based, and now they're aligned to the common core. So it, it addresses a lot of those issues for us, and it frees up a lot of our teachers to be able to then develop those other programs where they're focusing on passion with the kids um, or what the child is passionate about. But I think that one of the biggest attributes of a charter school that a lot of the public schools don't have is the ability to hire industry experts. So we have, you know, art classes taught by a person that's actually a professional artist. Our photography class is actually taught by a professional ph photographer. I mean, these are things that when you bring in the rigor, you bring in the expectations of what the industry is. So if a child really is going, going, going to go into that field or look to go into um, you know, photography, art, music, dance, drama, whatever it is, you have to make sure that the person that's actually working with them is a professional in the field. Uh, I think that's one of the biggest things that's overlooked a lot of times in charter schools have a lot more ability to do those things. You know, I think that the other thing you have to look at is funding. I mean, you know, obviously funding for the, all of those programs right now is being, are being cut across the country and, they, and across the rest of the world. Um, you know, we, we are actually increasing those. So we've increased our enrollment in our 2D animation, 3D animation, and digital game design courses. And the reason being is that we know that those courses, the way they're structured, um, we have a partnership with a program called Creative Academies, and it's creativeacademies.org. They're a nonprofit that works for educational change and working with museums um, as well that we've done. But I think that the biggest thing about it is keeping the rigor and tying it into something they're passionate about, but then also making sure it aligns to something that's an educational outcome like a standard uh, or a benchmark. And just to give an example of that is we have a program 
we use Scratch, the MIT open source, the MIT program. It's not open source, but MIT program that you can actually utilize to develop animations and simulations. And we use this as early as first grade. And we teach kids concepts around a game called Pirate Dog. And Pirate Dog is actually a Cartesian plane, which is normally taught in the standards across the country in grade six or grade seven. Our kids learn to manipulate the colors of the dog, the playing field, and to then play the game. They don't realize that while they're doing that, they're actually learning mathematical skills and, al and algorithms that are actually going to be later introduced in either middle school or high school in algebra by playing this game. So it's the way you actually can then put uh, those skills into it, but you're actually then the level of rigor is right implied because you're actually aligning it to something they're going to see later on in their lives. Well, we can kind of swing back to John Taylor Gatto for a minute here related to that, I think, because you know the story, the narrative what we're telling now about the factory model school is that it was, or at least one of the narratives, was that it was really geared towards sorting students out and having most of them fail and some small percentage move forward. Whether or not that story is fully accurate, you know, our new narrative around education is sort of every child has brilliance within them. Um, you know, how do, how do you, does that work? Can, can you feel like you're, you are in some way helping every student? I think, I think the biggest fact that you have to have is, that, you know, showing a program works and then scaling it up. I mean, like we talked about Scratch and someone else just putting the text just put about SketchUp. Those are two phenomenal programs. Um, the education the model right now, you know, as Dewey actually spoke about as well uh, many, many years ago, is the system right now is broken. Um, if we look at where we are, you know, nationally we're behind other countries graduating technically skilled students for the global economy. You know, if you look at 40% of our college graduates don't even use their degrees. You know, so there, there's a dramatically, dramatic disconnect between business and education. And I think that we need to honestly look to refocus our priorities and, and you know, risk per se, re reinvesting or rebuilding the new infrastructure of, of public education. And I think it's a must at this point. You know, people say, I don't want to rock the boat. You know, you have to flip the boat over, honestly, and start looking at things. Uh, you know, only did the phoenix rise from the ashes that, you know, to, to create something new. That We have to actually look at what we're doing and whether or not the system actually works. You know, we expect excellence across the board in this nation from sports to education, uh, to entertainment. But we don't put the same expectations upon education. And I don't, I'm sorry, I don't understand it. It's just one of those things I always, I'm troubled by. One of the guests I've really enjoyed having on the show is Karen Egan. And Karen says that we have sort of three different um, guiding um, principles for education, or the, the things that we want education to do, and that the three are actually almost uh, in conflict with each other. Uh, one is for the cultural transmission, the next is an, an, a knowledge absorption, and then the third is sort of individual and personal growth. And his argument is that those three actually don't work well together. If we think about education changing and the need for education to change, it has to go through sort of logical steps. And so is the next logical step to demonstrate in schools like yours that you can do it. But are there going to be people who have a different conception of education? And, and does the system need to have the same kind of outcomes for everybody? Well, I think if you look at the, the attributes of No Child Left Behind for good or bad, um, I think that the idea and the premise of No Child Left Behind of trying to get everyone on the same page was great. But what happened was the implementation at the state level was, was varied and it didn't work. So I think that what we have to look at is I think that the growth model is probably the best uh, metric that we can actually use showing where that child started, where they finished, and where do they compete or compare against their other students either in their district, their school, or on the nation and show that that child is moving in the right direction. And provided that's going to happen, that's one thing we can definitely use um, to see for the future. I think that honestly the growth model would drive everything as opposed to these standardized assessments and I've been fortunate enough to work for a lot of states looking at assessment items and looking at assessments. And you know it's amazing to see the level of rigor and the expectations and in some of the assessments and it doesn't match what they're trying to assess in their standards and benchmarks. So I mean there's a total disconnect between these single end-of-year course assessments um, 
at each state level as opposed to looking at a national model for an assessment like they're doing with the American Diploma Project and working on Now and Achieve. Uh, I think that's going to help this, the country move forward as, as a group. There's no doubt about that. As far as the system, the system has to be on the same page in the sense of it can't be, if you're talking about a socialized system in the sense of where the federal government would oversee all education, I honestly don't think that's going to work, obviously, for multiple reasons from the Constitution down to just the being 48 of the 50 states, the, the different cultures in each community would never be able to be implemented. Uh, I think that we have to look at, you know, a significant investment in our children's future and face the stark reality that there's not enough right funding. Um, looking at efficiencies, but, you know, it may looking at, it may also be as committing additional funds from other sources nationwide, and it may end up being an educational tax or something like that. There are so many teachers out there that they go through their master's programs, and if they continue on of 30 above, 30 credits above, or 60 credits above, and, and they end up getting paid less than they would if they were an entry level, you know, worker in, in the business industry. So one of the things we have to look at is paying teachers as professionals and expecting accountability from them as well, but making sure that you know uh, they are accountable. This is a really fun place to explore. So I, I'm going to cut. I shift this into social media a little, and I'll do so by kind of drawing a comparison. Um, it, it feels as though a lot of what we saw in Egypt kind of made us feel like the democratization movement um, is helped by social media, and that more and more teachers and students and parents are going to have voice in education by virtue of social media. Then we see social media also being kind of a uh, spark that lights or, or uh, helps create an explosion when there's heavy dissatisfaction, like in London. Um, before we get into the specifics of social media for students, sort of in the broader cultural perspective, uh, do you think that social media will have an impact on how decisions are going to get made about education and who's going to participate in them? Well, I think that if you end up looking at social media worked great for me. I ended up being a, key, a keynote at, at ISTE. So I think the social media is great for that aspect of it. Uh, I'm sure other people didn't see it is that, you know, they should have probably chosen someone as opposed to me being voted by the masses. Uh, I'm fortunate that that happened. In reality, though, if you look at like the French president, the French uh, elections, and you look at Obama, they were definitely influenced by social media. So the political activism definitely directly ties back into the social media, social media of this generation. Would educational reform come um, and be voted on, per se, or actually pushed by social media? I think that it would definitely would, but you're only looking at one demographic. You know, a lot of people in their 50s and above don't use social media for that aspect and then don't tweet or they use Facebook just to stay in touch with friends or any other kind of social media tool. But I think that when you start looking at it for educational outcomes in the classroom, I think social media is going to have a huge impact for the future uh, of our children. There's no doubt about that. There was a really good article in the New York Times this past week on sort of how social media ends up creating very surface level conversations that push out. Uh, the time to spend in deeper thought, um, and, and maybe even create polarization around issues, and certainly we've seen that in some aspects of Twitter with regard to education reform. Um, so let's kind of jump to the students. How do you help them to see social media as being a healthy part of their education? Well, I think the biggest thing is, is um, you have to teach safe and ethical use. That starts at the earliest levels, and it starts with the parents as well at home. Uh, we, we're a one-to-one -one school here. Um, we actually uh, distribute laptops to every one of our students with desktops to kindergarten to fourth graders. And what we do is we actually then have parents, before they get their machines, they have to come into training. They have to go through uh, where to put the machine, how to set it up, how to manage it at home, um, what to do and to check basically a history if you want to make sure that your child is doing things that they're supposed to be doing. Um, Someone asked the question, are laptops provided by the school? Yeah, they actually are provided by the school. We actually lease them through Apple. So, uh, you know, it, 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 it's one of those things that safe and ethical use is, is something that it goes as you, as you grow. It, it changes for your world as well. So I have a daughter that's 13 and, and named Noelle, and my son Jonathan is 11. They're dramatically different students. My daughter is, is very... Um, tech savvy in the sense of using social media to stay in touch with our friends, to communicate, to take pictures and things like that and to share it, as well as to use social media for homework. And whereas my son, he'll use it, but he uses it through his Xbox. 
and you know he's he's using the same kind of tool she is, but they're using it for different means. So I think that the students in the classroom, what you stated was definitely 100% correct about it. It does introduce a surface learning, but when you learn learn to use their you know their own mobile devices or mobile learning devices in their classrooms, and that's another thing that's an issue that we have to address is when you have a mobile learning device environment that you're able to bring in anything and put it on the network per se and have access to uh, information at your fingertips, I think that's going to change the way a teacher teaches. So for an example, if you type hashtag in Twitter, if you type hashtag science and then click search, you're going to find everything that has to do, all the tweets that contain anything that has to do with science. And then you can actually start those conversations and even make it more defined up to the 140 characters that you're allowed. So I think that using it, you know, social media to drive a tool, a tool that kids are going to use to drive the education, where the teacher becomes the facilitator of the knowledge, I think that's going to be huge in the classroom. And I think it's going to be uh, something that's going to change the way teachers teach. It feels like that's not going to come without some pain because you have technologies that are new enough that we don't fully grasp where they where they where they benefit and where they don't, and you have uh, you know a significant number of educators who themselves don't know how to do that. So in your particular case, you could choose teachers who would. I'm guessing that in most schools, it's a very small percentage of teachers who would understand how to use those technologies even well enough to teach their students. I would definitely agree. I mean, um, if you want to read a great blog, you know, Lisa Nielsen, uh, you know, the innovative educator, she actually talks about social media and she talks about uh, using cell phones and she's a big advocate for cell phones and education. But I think that the biggest thing you have to look at is that, that you have to become, you know, the, the facilitator of, of knowledge and the facilitator in that classroom of utilizing those tools for educational outcomes. And I think that the tools change so quickly like you're talking about and the uh, you don't have to know how to do everything. I, I tell my teachers this. I said, you know, you're going to have a kid in the classroom that's the expert. All you have to do is understand how to guide them through the process, understand what that tool can do, I said, and then take them from there. I said, you know, you're not going to have to learn how to use, you know, every aspect of Adobe Photoshop as it goes from one level to the next. You have to understand the basic applications of it. So I think that one of the biggest things that we have to look at is whether or not um, – in the schools, we, we have those teachers and start them in, in micro pockets in the school. So if one teacher wants to try a pilot program, let them try a pilot program and let them be the one that designs that program with you so it's safe and ethically implemented. But also the biggest thing is to make sure that they're, they have students that are passionate about doing it as well. You don't want to force a child to do something like that that really doesn't know, um, in the, you know how to use a tool or whatever it is. They just have to make sure that they're passionate about it. Make it a club first and then implement it in the classroom. So it seems like the you know one hurdle is the um, sort of the rapid nature of the technology adoption and how you know a lot of teachers don't have familiarity with it. It also seems like parents would be would kind of push back on this. You know how have you found the parents reacting to the work that you've done, and how much do you have to spend time communicating with the parents about the value of some of these things? It, it's funny we have parents that come into us and they say you. Um, you provided us a laptop, and now we want to lock it down in our house. And normally they'll come, just the conversation for me would be, you know, all right, well, what are you trying to actually do and why? You know, and I'll explain to them the value of the technology and how it can actually help their child achieve in school in the sense of giving them access to instant information and access to the web as well as collaborative tools. Um, and, you know, actually Mark just wrote something 100% true here as well, is that when you look at a parent or a teacher – or anyone else, and our parents in our school are very, very involved because it's a hybrid blended school, so our kids are not in school every single day. So we do have access to our parents, and we are a school of choice. So it is a little bit different from us in the sense of what we're expecting our parents to do, but it, it actually comes from a different philosophy. They have to understand what those tools are going to do for their child, how it's going to help them to get access to information, to be able to utilize that tool, uh, and everything else in, in, you know, in their education. But, you know, if you have to bring, somebody just wrote it, I was just going to say the same thing, is you have to bring parents in. We have more parent trainings at night, 6 to 9 at night, you know, in, in Hawaii here. And we, we offer them online to illuminate, to Blackboard Collaborate now. We offer them online on a regular basis, even on Saturdays and Sundays, and they're all recorded. So we actually engage our parents as much as we possibly can. I think sometimes to a forward, parents get sick of us.
I'm laughing and clapping at the same time. Do you think, Jeff, we're going to move to uh, bring your own device as the primary model for technology in schools? Is it going to be like the calculator where there's just an expectation that the parents provide the device? And, and have you thought about that? You know, it's when I was in, it's still in the Department of Education here in Hawaii. We had a project to be working with on, on the big island of Hawaii. Um, and we were trying to do a uh, Rube Goldberg project to design, a, a, if you know the game Mousetrap, similar to that. And we want the kids to actually help design it utilizing technology, using either, at that time, iPads had just come out, uh, or using a laptop or something else. And the school didn't have enough of them in the school to go around. So we told the kids, listen, in two weeks we're going to have this project. Can you bring in an, a, a mobile-enabled device, laptop, whatever it is, phone, whatever it is, and because we're going to do research, we're going to do this, and every child came to the table with one, and it's not, a, it's not an affluent community, it's very uh, rural, and every child had access to it, so I think as long as they have, knowing what it is, you can actually utilize those tools, and, uh, and most people will come to the table with something. I think that, some, that you're going to have to have the school supplement for the students that are free and reduced lunch, or students that are homeless, you know, and things like that. We actually have a homeless population that's in our school currently, and we provide them with laptops. But what we actually explain to them is what they're supposed to do to take care of it, you know, while they're not at the school. And the other thing is we put CompuTrace on it, and to make sure we lock it down in the sense of if it, could, if it gets stolen, we can find it. So it's just making sure you protect your, your investment with the tool that you're actually putting in the school as well. But also, um, I think that most parents, if it's going to be used and they see a value in it, then they'll find a, a way to get it for their children. So Carolyn has a question about uh, the webinars for the parents. Uh, and then I want to drill down a little bit more on students. She's asking about, uh, she wants to know uh, if you give a little bit more information about how you do that and what you do. OK, so we offer, our parent trainings are offered. Uh, we have a communication slash parent. Uh, she's called learning coach support, because uh, our parents are called learning coaches. And what she does is she actually then uh, provides them with uh, being a better learning coach, going through the basics of what am I expecting while I'm in this school. And literally from day one of opening the curriculum online, that she goes through what it's going to be like in the experience. And she's had, she has three kids in the school, so she has done this every aspect of, and she's been here since we started. Um, and she's great in the sense of the trainings that she does. We actually back that up with parent trainings that come from our teachers. So our teachers have orientations for the parents as well that are online as well as face-to-face. -face. And you have to remember the one thing is because we are not just a stri strictly online school. We're a hybrid or blended school. We have mandatory components that students and parents have to come to. So they have to be in for face-to-face -face conferences. They have to do baseline assessments so we can actually use the growth model to implement student growth to show that over time um, and things like that. So I think that one of the biggest things, you know, uh, it's a partnership, and we tell people that it's a triangle. It's the school, the parent, and the student. And without any part of that, this is not going to work. And we tell them that you are an active participant in your child's education. The last thing is someone asked if we actually, um, somebody asked, I guess, it was if we require parents to pay insurance for the laptops. We do. It's $100 per year for the insurance for the laptops. If they're free or reduced lunch, or if they could show that they're in, uh, uh, in need, then we actually waive it, and the school actually pays for it through our enrichment funds that we use by fundraising and things like that. So it's been really wild building that model and you know doing things with the school and figuring out how to work the the one to one laptops. But I'm fortunate, you know, it, it's amazing to me the educational community. If you tell them you're trying something new, I'm I'm lucky. I'm friends with Elliot Soloway and and you know Kathy Norris for years. I know him from when I was in the classroom. And when I told Elliot I was trying to do this and I told him I was going to use laptops, he's like, why? He says, just use any kind of learning device. I was like, because it standardizes for us at the school level that every child has access. And then what we do is we moved from there now and we started using iPads and iPod Touches and other items in the school to supplement and create, you know, and now we have an Android class. So we actually have Android phones that just have access for the internet, they can't make phone calls. So they can actually develop apps for Androids as well. So I think, and it's looking at the community and what the community values. So we went to the, you know, specific people like, you know, uh, Mark Lockridge is a phenomenal partner with the school and he runs that Creative Academies uh, program. And Mark actually, you know, has donated back to the school as well as people like Hank Rogers of Tetris and other people in the community have come to the table to help us knowing we're trying to change the way we educate our children. Okay, so let's sort of shift to the students again, if we could. Um, 
I, I watched your uh, Flintstones Jetsons talk um, and really enjoyed it. And one of the things that occurred to me while I was watching it was that it feels like we kind of are of two minds about the current generation of students. They are um, there maybe is a little bit of a tendency to kind of glamorize their capabilities or their facility with the tech, but the other the other story is that um, they're worse students than they've ever been, and they end up coming to college with even worse writing skills because of uh, the social technologies. What's your personal take on kind of this um, where students are today, how it might compare to 10 or 15 years ago, and what things we should be particularly thinking about? Well, I mean, if you look at the, the statistics nationally, um, it, it's astounding how many children come into college or into the workforce, for that matter, without the basic skills in mathematics and writing. Um, what we, how do we address that in our school? We have mandatory face-to-face -face classes for writing for kindergarten to third grade. So even if the writing program is, is offered online and you're actually doing the work in your book, you still have to come in for writing classes. We also have a mandatory half credit and expository writing for us for our seniors so that they have to be able to be proficient in writing leaving us. I think that that's something that should be a national uh, movement is that there should be some way that a student has to take a writing class to make sure that they do come out of school with the basic writing skills. And the other thing is, is you know, I live in Hawaii. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to, to be here, and I understand the value of the Hawaiian language, and, and we have a huge cultural program here at the school. Uh, but, you know, we only accept standard written English in the classroom. When I was in New York City, and we were going to Ebonics, you know, uh, it, it, we only accepted at that time, and I was teaching in the South Bronx, and, and literally, you know, a 99% uh, African-American and Hispanic community. We did not accept slang in the classroom, and you did not accept you know, any kind of other, you know, uh, dialect in the classroom. You have to accept standard written English in the classroom because that's what they expect when you get to college and that's what they expect in the workforce. So I think we have to make sure that we have those proficiencies there for those children. Um, and, and as far as kids coming in with the basic skills, it's, you know, it's the same premise of, you know, someone comes in that they can speak Spanish, right? But people don't understand that, that they may be able to speak the language, but they may be functionally illiterate in Spanish as well. And then what happens is you start teaching them English, and then they're basically illiterate in two languages. So you have to look at the same thing with the technology. Kids come in, they know how to use the technology for a certain aspect of their lives, whatever it is, friends, texting, whatever it is. You have to actually teach them then what the value of it is in the educational setting and then teach them how to utilize it in a safe and ethical way. What are you doing about student portfolios? Are you um, doing anything in that regard? I couldn't answer a better straight man, Steve, honestly. We actually, uh, we partnered with the same thing with Creative Academies. We're doing an e-portfolio system. Um, I've been fortunate enough to work with some people on ePortfolios.org. And if you ever want to join it, it's a, just a Google group, and you can actually ask any questions you have about creating e-portfolios. Um, you know, it's been amazing to us to look at how we digitize the artifacts to show a child's educational learning progression through the years. And now we're actually digitizing their Scratch and Google SketchUp as well into that same uh, infrastructure. So they'll have a digital portfolio when they come out to show that learning progression over time. It's going to be amazing to us because one of the nicest things is that we're able to develop these things from scratch or take someone else's ideas and then build upon them because uh, there's so much out there that you can actually build upon. And so many people have made the mistakes already. So it's the nicest thing is to have that community to ask and not have to worry about it. You know, and there's so many people in Hawaii, and we were fortunate enough to the work of uh, people like Mark Hines to, to actually get a Hawaii Society of Technology Education that just came about at the last ISTE, so we got approved. So now we're going to build that you know collaborative effort here in Hawaii to have everyone get together, so you know we can do this as a group for the betterment of all the students. And so I think that e-portfolios are great tool. Um, it's more and more colleges are, are on the applications. It says, please submit your website. If you have a digital portfolio, can you please submit it either via DVD or the website to can actually get it but if you're using an iWeb page or something like that. What about uh, kind of a parallel um, collection? So not necessarily the e-portfolio, but kind of a document or some way of identifying what the student is interested in, how they like to learn, and those kinds of things. Um, I'm not even sure what to call that. 
but I see it come through the advisory programs where they're sort of a learning how to learn and then documenting how that, that student likes to learn. Have you looked at that at all? Sorry, I forgot my mic. Uh, I think that, you know, when you're looking at the portfolios, you're looking at the, how, do you, how do you figure out that well-rounded student and what, how do you get the best picture of who that child actually is? You know, the biggest thing is, is that, you know, Tony Wagner came out years ago with the rigor, relevance, relationship framework. And for me, it's always been the third R, the relationship R, is the most important R. And the reason being is if you can actually find out what that child is interested in. And for us, it goes for as well for our parents, our learning coaches in our schools, because if we can find out what drives that parent's uh, ideas and expectations for their child, then we can better serve them and their family. So I think the relationship is a huge piece to actually bring in the relevance and the rigor into that child's education and then looking at that whole picture to address those uh, ideas of passion and what they want to follow in their education. Have you seen that uh, formalized? Uh, Carolyn put in a, uh, a phrase, learning style assessments. You know, if a student moves from one school to the other, is there any um, device for communicating uh, what's been found out in that relationship? Well, I think the biggest challenge you're always going to have is if they leave from one place um, to the other, uh, then you're always going to have a problem with that, that document following them unless you create a web page or you create a digital e-portfolio so you can actually have those artifacts in there. And, you know, it's one of the things that somebody actually uh, put in here and I, I see is, is weighing artifacts versus examples, formative versus summative uses. I think the biggest thing is figuring out what you want that portfolio to look like and what you want to exemplify when they're leaving your school. Uh, so I think that that's the aspect of what you're doing is you sit down, you design it, and find out what you want it to showcase. So for us, we use it for the formal educational piece, putting in their formative assessments, their summative assessments, what they've, done, what they've done in their formal education, but also we put the informal stuff in there. You know, what artifact did they create in, you know, creating a, a, something in a 3D animated world using Google SketchUp that you can actually share with everyone else and show them the process they went through and the critical thinking skills that they implemented to be able to actually show that they knew this concept and then implemented it in the, in the 3D world. And, uh, and Helen Barrett, by the way, is the ePortfolio guru. She's phenomenal. And it's electronicportfolios.com, and that's who she is, and she's phenomenal. If you want to go on, just join the Google group, and they'll help you do anything you want to do around ePortfolios. It would seem to me that in a world increasingly centered around the individual interests and passions, um, that you would, that we're going to need to formalize some of that communication in some way to make it a little bit easier to, to identify. I'm, I'll be intrigued by that. Okay, so it's time to move to Q&A. If you have a question for Jeff, there is a raise your hand icon. In the participants box, there's a hand and it's the third icon over and if you click on that you can raise your hand and we'll give you the mic and you can ask Jeff a question or you can put a question in the chat. Um, Jeff, I was intrigued about colleges asking for websites. Uh, I didn't realize that was taking place, but it is taking place now. Yeah, I think the first one is to actually do it with, with Stanford University. But on the application itself now, it says, if, it says, please enter your website. If you have a website, please enter your website. If you have a, an electronic portfolio, is actually on Stanford's website as well. You actually ask for an electronic portfolio as well now. And it's becoming more and more of the norm. Interesting. Okay, so Gary's the first one to ask a question. Gary, I've given you audio permissions. You click on the talk button, which should be close to the top of your screen on the left-hand side to turn your mic on. Let's see if you can do that. Oh, he's asking it in the chat. Jeff, how can cash strapped districts use limited funds to promote these technology advancements? A great question. Um, you know, looking at how we're trying to do things, you're going to get cell phones from corporations that are actually getting rid of them at the end of the year. Uh, you can actually go to places and look for, like we, when I was in New York and I had uh, a very underserved population in Brooklyn, we actually went to the credit union. When they were outdating their computers, which is only with only every two years, every three years, we were taking their refurbished computers and actually using those computers in the classrooms. So it's looking at innovative ways to get access to technology in the students' hands. You know what? I, I'm not above begging, um, borrowing, and pleading to people uh, on behalf of my kids. You know, I'm, a ver I'm an advocate for children, and, you know, I I'll ask anyone that willing to help, can you help us in this way? And it's amazing that people are willing to help us. They know the value, the dollar is being spent 
on the children and something that's going to help their education. Uh, I've had people come to me and tell me that they wanted to donate money to the school, and I'll tell them to wait, and they'll look at me like I'm crazy. And I'll say, listen, let's wait till we have a project that fits your passion and what your expectations are, as well as what we're trying to accomplish. Because for me to take your money uh, and to use it on something else, I don't think that's fair to you or to the school. You know, but the other thing is, you know, they say in old time, and not only in Hawaii, but they don't want the money going into a black hole where it's going to pay for something that's not going to help the children or benefit the children. Peggy wanted to know if you could give us the URL again for the Google ePortfolio link. Was it a Google group? I, I'm not sure what it was. Jeff, did we lose your mic? Nope, I'm here. I'm just pulling it up actually right now. But if you just Google Helen Barrett, you can actually pull up the group. But I, I'm almost positive it's, it's K-12 ePortfolios. Let me pull up my email right here. It's, uh, yeah, it's K-12 e K-12 ePortfolios at googlegroups.com is the email. And then they'll add you to the, to the group, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great site. I've been on there for now for about uh, probably two and a half years. You know, and it's, it's using Google apps and ePortfolios for education, but they actually speak about all different aspects of uh, ePortfolios. So, Mark, uh, you've got your hand raised, and I've given you the microphone. To turn on your mic, you click on the Talk button. I can see that Mark is typing. He may not have microphone capability, but it looks like you may have a question, Mark. Uh, if you've got a question for Jeff, anybody else? You have the new interface, OK. So if you ha do you have a microphone, Mark? Because if you do, there's a Talk button that should be toward the top left of your screen. You can click on that, and it will turn on your microphone. And if anyone else has a question, please feel free to raise your hand as well or to put it in the chat. We'll give Mark just a second here. While we're waiting for Mark. Uh, Jeff, one of the things that intrigues me about kind of the shift from Web 2.0 to the semantic web or Web 3.0 uh, is demonstrated in Google search results. Um, there's you know, some growing understanding of the fact that when you and I search Google, we may get very different results or different results, um, uh, which brings us really to the digital literacy issue and search literacy. Have you, have you addressed that specifically with your students, or have you thought about um, you know, kind of how you would teach that? You know, one of the biggest things uh, is in my book, um, the blogs, which is in podcast book. Uh, the first chapter is actually on informational literacy, uh, teaching to, to children to utilize uh, Boolean expressions and, and, and actually using uh, advanced search tools. Because I think that one of the things people have to learn is, is you know, you get hit genetics and you get 53 million in, you know, results in 0 0.0012 seconds. That doesn't help you. You know, you have to understand what, how you drill down within the search engines to understand that. So informational literacy is a key component of what we're doing here at the school. Uh, it's funny to watch the parents when you start teaching them about how to do things, and then right away they'll be like, oh, can you search how to make, you know, cookies using this? It's, it's funny, the things that come out of their mouth, because they, they want to get down to, to what drives them and what they're passionate about. Um, but that's part of the whole thing about is becoming collaborative partners with people to, under, to have them understand that, you know, informationally and digitally literate are two different things, but informational literacy is a key component to a child's education because if they understand how to utilize the tools, um, they'll, you know, they'll be able to, to find things quicker, to more to refine, and, you know, and if they go on for their master's degree or their doctorate, then they understand how much easier it is to find the information they're looking for. So it looks like Mark may have found the talk button. Mark, do you want to give it a try? Kind of embarrassing for me. My apologies. Aloha, Jeff. How are you doing? I hope you're okay. Listen, Jeff, the question I've got is a broader one. You know that um, you and I have talked before about change institutionally. And I know at least in part, part of your interest isn't you run a fabulous school, but part of that is to challenge notions of schooling in Hawaii here in the islands as well as nationally. And I'm wondering if you can comment on what you see as the way your school and, and HTA and what it's done, and how that acts in sort of Clay Christensen's model of sort of a disruptive force, and whether you've seen that impact at all in the Department of Education locally here in Hawaii or nationally. 
Uh, great question, Mark. And, you know, we have seen that. They, they were nice enough to send the state auditors to us and to come down with compliance because, you know, our test scores were high and they were like, I, I invited them to come in and to bring the newspapers the next time they came as well. But I think that the way we look at it is, you know, when you look at disruptive innovations like, you know, Craig Christensen and Mike Horn write, write about, you're looking at how it changes things for the better and how we can actually then do what we're doing and make, like, not per se, like little mini HTAs, but our model has been refined over the three years. We've made mistakes. We've done things that we, that, you know, didn't really work out for us. But you know what? We adjusted as time went on. That's one of the biggest things about having that ability, as long as it doesn't impact the student's education and the outcomes. So the biggest thing is we're trying to keep that as consistent as possible. But, you know, when we look at, you know, government agencies, the Department of Defense, larger corporations, and universities, right, rapidly advancing into the Internet delivered classrooms and trainings via iPod, iPhone, and the iPad, you know, we realize that distance learning can work in rural schools, and it really is the future of the world in which we live. Um, you know, we have to also build technically supported, you know, social network types uh, for schools. So we have a blog that's internal to the school that we utilize called The Big Think, and that has aspects of parent chat rooms as well as student chat rooms, you know. And, and this ties into professional development as well, Mark, and to everyone else, is that when you look at, you, you can have teachers located in a central hub. And, we, and as a staff developer, I used to go to schools and do PD or perform PD. And, you know, sometimes we used to get around in New York that was drive-by PD, which is two hours, you know, a session, and you come back, and now when people leave, after like, what happened here? And, and unfortunately, a lot of keynote speakers and a lot of people are like that. Uh, one of the things that I tell districts when I go to work with them or when I'm going, like, going to Australia, I'm doing three days of workshops in Australia um, before and after my keynote, working with the people. So it's not just a one-shot deal. So I think that, Mark, the biggest thing is actually looking at how you make these things sustainable over time and how you can actually then take that disruptive force to show that it can be implemented, even if it is on a smaller scale, into the formal education setting. So, for example, taking a high school that has a population of students that are advanced learners, and just using them as an example here, not to say that they're the only ones, but and then offering them online classes through their four years possibly getting them out a year early or a semester early to start college or to go into workforce or whatever they're going to do. But that also has multiple, many different aspects. It, it decreases budget at the school level because now the teachers aren't carrying as many uh, on their load. It actually then also, the kids graduate early. That helps for the AYP and No Child Left Behind accountability. But it also then gives the kids aspects of you know, what they need to do in the real world like Massachusetts did is nobody works in, in isolation any longer. You're working collaborative groups or collaborative teams. So in Massachusetts, they mandated that each child, before they graduate from high school, take one online class because that's the way the world is moving. And if you look at the statistics over the last 10 years, you, know, you went from 40% you know, of the people working um, in 2005 in a virtual environment that it's over 60% of the people now working one day in a virtual environment now and that number is going to shift dramatically as time goes on in the next couple of years. I think one of the things that's so fascinating about what's taking place here, Jeff, is that it's not just sort of the disruptive innovation and the creativity and innovative ideas. Uh, it's the fact that they are then getting shared very directly. Um, so as a principal or a superintendent or a teacher, you're typically communicating with others and getting those ideas sort of very rapidly and, and oftentimes building together the new models. I think we're at the end of our hour. I uh, really appreciate your being here. Did you want to give any final thoughts? I really appreciate you inviting me. That's the one thing. You know, we have to realize one thing is that, and, I, and I'm fortunate enough to speak all over the world. I'll be in Australia in October and Abu Dhabi in in November at BETT and then in London in January. But we, we have to realize we're the most powerful nation economically and militarily, yet we accept mediocrity in education, and it impacts our economy. You know, if you look at what the Wall Street Journal talking about workforce development and putting increased pressure on schools to produce needed skilled workers, right, the harsh fact is American students are falling behind other nations. And if we honestly don't start transitioning how we do things and focusing on preparing our kids for the future, right, then we're really going to lose that rank uh, internationally, you know, and make sure that we have to push these things. You know, I really appreciate everyone doing this. And, uh, you know, someone asked a question what I'll be doing in London. I'll actually be speaking at BET at there as well, uh, B-E-T-T, -T, uh, while I'm in London. I think that's in January, if I'm not mistaken. I just don't know what the exact dates I have to look on my calendar. But thank you, Steve. I really appreciate everyone for, for being here. 
Thanks, Jeff. I'm using the clapping icon, which often gets confused with the raised hand, but it's the smiley face. Hover over the smiley face and go down to applause, and you'll see you can applaud. And if you raise your hand, Jeff will know you're, you're applauding as well. Hey, thanks, Jeff. We make it a point to stop on time. Really appreciate your taking the time out of your day because it is Hawaii time and you are in the middle of your school day or whatever you're doing. So thanks so much for being here. No problem, Steve. Thanks again. And thanks, everybody, for coming. That was delightful, a really fun conversation, and, and well worth uh, the time and learning about uh, what Jeff's doing. So uh, we'll go ahead and close the room now, turn the recording off. Thanks for being a part of this, and we'll look forward to future sessions. Take care, everybody. Bye.